Welcome to the Data Science Institute's virtual seminar series. My name is Dr. Sarah Mackey from Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Here at Lawrence Livermore, data science has become an essential discipline in many of our key program areas. LLNL is home to many challenging data sets, as well as home to some of the world's most advanced supercomputers. Our data science staff work in a variety of areas, including machine learning, artificial intelligence, big data analytics, statistical inference, predictive modeling, and uncertainty quantification. The Data Science Institute acts as a central hub for our lab's data science activities. We host events like this seminar series in order to introduce new ideas and potential collaborations to our laboratory staff. We invite speakers from outside the laboratory, from the Bay Area and beyond, to share their innovative approaches with our data science community. We are pleased now to include a wider audience in our seminar series through these recordings. You can read about past speakers at our website at data-science.llnl.gov or you can email us at datascience at llnl.gov. Thank you and enjoy the seminar series. Uh, today it's my pleasure to welcome Josh Levine. Uh, Josh is an Associate Professor of Computer Science at the University of Arizona. Before joining Arizona, he was an assistant professor at Clemson University from 2012 to 2016. And before that, he was a postdoctoral researcher at University of Utah's Scientific Computing and Imaging Institute. He's a recipient of the 2018 DOE Career Award. He received his PhD in computer science from The Ohio State University in 2009 after completing BS degrees in computer engineering and mathematics and also a master's in computer science from Case Western Reserve University. His research include, interests include visualization, geometric modeling, topological analysis, mesh generation, vector fields, performance analysis, and computer graphics. So, Josh, thank you for joining us and go ahead and begin when you are ready. All right. Well, th thanks, Sarah, for that kind introduction. Um, and, and thank you all for, for coming to the talk today. It's really exciting for me to, to give a presentation at Livermore. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I, I'm a fairly regular visitor to the lab, although it's been a couple of years with everything with the pandemic. Um, and I'm looking forward to the, the next chance I have to come out there. But in the meantime, I'm happy to take a, a virtual chance uh, in the middle. Uh, so, so to dive right in, to, today I'm going to talk to you about um, some of the new work I've been working on for, I guess, the past maybe three or four years on trying to use neural network models and coupling them with volume visualization systems. And, and I myself am a visualization person, um, so I, I have to admit um, I'm almost an apologist with respect to using neural networks these days, but they've become such an intimate part of using or, or being used in visualization techniques. Uh, I think the whole community has really had to switch around for the past few, two, few years to think about them. Um, I like to start talks like this with just a couple of high level questions. So basically everyone in the audience can understand a little bit more about me and, and where this work was done and, and why we were doing this work in the first place. Um, so I'm gonna try to answer these questions of who, where, why, and what to begin the talk. First of all, there's a number of people who deserve a lot of credit for this work. Um, and these are the collaborators and people who are involved with the work. Um, I'm gonna present two different research topics today. The first topic is work that was conducted uh, predominantly uh, with collaborators uh, Matt Berger and Jishin Lee. Matt Berger is a faculty member at Vanderbilt and Jishin is a PhD student working with me. Um, it's actually a couple years old. This was work that was published in 2018 uh, and then presented in Viz in the same year. Um, part two of the work uh, is a continued collaboration again with Matt, um, but the students involved switched around a little bit. Um, in particular, an undergraduate student working with Matt, Brian Liu, and then a PhD student working with me, Kai Rong Jiang, uh, both did this work. And this was recently presented at Euroviz last summer in 2021. Um, so this is an, an interesting collaboration between uh, a large collection of people here um, and the work has been conducted across a couple different universities um, to just kind of motivate why. Well, um, I want to really give a, a high level motivation to um, why analyze um, scalar field data or why analyze and do volume visualization in the first place. Um, so the working model for the data set that we're going to talk about today is basically treating data as scalar functions. So these are functions defined over some manifold M and at every position in M I have some value. Very, very generic type of way to model data. Um, you can do this for lots of different things. You can model temperature over the surface of the earth this way. If you were doing a simulation of a burning engine, you could model the concentration of fuel or the concentration of other chemical compounds in that uh, simulation. You could use this for me um, medical imaging and do things like model the amount of water when a cell, things like that. Um, so interpreting scalar data this way has tons of interesting challenges. 
I don't want to present this in such a way that I have solved all of them. In fact, this is something that the visualization community has studied for, I don't know, upwards of four decades now in terms of different ways to do visualization here. Um, but in particular today, I'm going to focus on a particular class of scalar fields. I'm going to talk about what happens when the scalar field itself is three dimensional. And in that case, I'll call this a volume and specifically at every position X, Y, and Z will have um, some set of value coded and we'll sample that over some range of positions. This is a little bit um, kind of technical in terms of this introduction, fairly high level, um, but in general, um, I, I like to kind of motivate with, well, what can you do if you do this well? Um, so here's just a couple examples of different volume visualizations that are out there um, that have been used to model a variety of different domains. The top left uh, is showing you a little bit of a medical scan, a CT scan. It's showing you the ability to use visualization to do things like model the surface and model the bone structure, model the cellular structures on the inside and so forth. Um, the two images on the right are scans that are coming from uh, DTMRI, they're showing you things like uh, the functional activations within the brain in different ways. And the picture on the bottom left is a data set that's looking at fuel injectors, and in particular, the fuel pattern that comes out of the end of the injector, which kind of forms these plumes as you're looking at on the end. So you can do lots of cool things with these sorts of volume visualizations. Um, and today I want to talk about, well, where can a neural network fit in? You, one, one, one way to look at the slide that's on the screen here is maybe volume visualization is already solved. Maybe we, we already know everything that we can do with volume visualization, and look, here's all these beautiful images that we can generate. Um, I suspect people on this call um, have used volume visualization before. Um, it's a, a pretty de facto tool now, and there's lots of pu um, public tools available for using it. Um, but if not, this will hopefully be an interesting introduction to you as well, and maybe point out that there are still some problems left to solve. And in particular, I'm going to do so by what you're seeing here on the screen, which is basically I'm going to present a generative model for doing this. And this is where neural networks fit in. We're going to in particular talk about generative networks and where they can map into the process of volume rendering. Uh, I just want to point out code for this uh, next segment of the talk is available online. You can go to the URL right here, um, github.com, and Matt Berger's uh, GitHub account is hosting it as well. So. Um, to understand where a neural network can fit in, I have to give you a little bit of an explanation for exactly how a volume renderer works. This will be a little bit high level, but hopefully by the end, you'll at least understand what are the knobs that a user gets to tweak. So the picture on the top left is a cartoon that's trying to illustrate this for you. Essentially, you have this gray cube on the top that you can think of as your volume data set. You can think about it as a collection of maybe uh, slices of data that you might be looking at. And when you volume visualize, what you do is you basically set a position for which you're going to look at it, which I'm going to use this kind of eye glyph to decide. Um, and from that position, you cast rays into the volume. And then for those rays that you cast in, you accumulate information um, that's basically doing something like simulating the volume as some kind of semi-transparent material. And what you do is you basically set color and opacity, that's what these two curves here are indicating, um, to decide to modulate and set that go going through. So when you do a volume rendering pass, you basically are saying, I want to produce a single image, like this image that you see here on the bottom left, um, that's essentially showing you one view of the data from one particular camera angle, um, where I'm controlled basically how the different scalar values are mapped to color and opacity. Remember in the volume viz model, we have only a single value at each position. And what I'm doing is I'm mapping those to basically how much I can see through them, how opaque they are, and what color here to kind of highlight different things along the way. And it turns out that there's a variety of controls that you get along the way. These user controls are essentially, well, I can pick where I view um, from. This is what I'll call the viewpoint. And basically I can rotate around and see the volume from different angles and that sort of thing. And then you get to pick what I'll call the opacity transfer function, which is basically your ability to specify where you can see within or what you can not see through as you're kind of looking through the volume. Uh, and then you have the color transfer function as well, which is basically which, which scalar values get mapped to which colors. Um, and, you know, I'm making the assumption here that the audience maybe hasn't used a volume render before. So what I'm going to do real quick is I just want to show you a little bit of a demo for how this looks. Um, I'm going to switch off from my slides for one second, and go into a tool called ParaView. It'll take me a second to load it up, but kind of just give you a feel for, for what you're doing when you might be working with a volume uh, render. So here we'll take the slides off for a second. Let me open up ParaView. Uh, and we'll take a look at it. So what I'm going to do is I'm demoing for you a piece of software called ParaView. This is an open source tool. It's been developed by a number of stakeholders in DOE labs. Um, there is, and I realize I might be tread, treading on thin ground here, there is a competitive tool at Livermore called Visit, but Visit and ParaView, in my experience, are being used by both the labs in shared ways. Um, and what I'll quickly do is I'll, I'll just load up a, a single data set for you. Um, so let me grab that data set for you and bring it up. All right, so this is volumetric data set. Paraview's default view just gives me kind of the outline for what the data set is. So there's this cube here that I can rotate around and you can see it's actually rectangular prism, whatever. 
Um, and if I want to look at the volume itself, well, the first thing I could do is say, well, maybe just look at a single slice by itself. And that's easy to do in ParaView. Um, I can just add a slice um, here, and we can take a look at it. Um, so the slice that I selected is defined by this red square that you have, and if I rotate around, you can see various things about it. And as you might have guessed, if you're paying attention to the text on the screen, we're looking at a volume that's a volume associated with a tooth. And in this particular slice, we actually get this nice kind of cross section of a tooth. Um, what's happening here is various values of the scalar data. It actually runs from 0 to 1300 are the data values that are in here. They're being mapped to individual colors by this color map that we're looking at here. Low values are these blue colors, middle values are these kind of white shades, and then it kind of veers into pink and red, and that's where you see the kind of higher values in the data set. And of course, I can move this slice around. I can pick different slices to take a look at. Um, and if I pick different slices, I get different aspects of the data. And if I start to rotate that slice around, maybe I can see other kind of slices on skew, and I get to see various things. Um, but to me, this is kind of unsatisfying. I only kind of get one slice at a time, and I have to kind of have a mental bottle of looking at all the different slices. This is what motivates using volume visualization in the first place. In fact, let's remove that slice for a second, and let's switch to what the type of view you get if you use a volume renderer here. Um, and now I've turned on the volume rendering view. You can see now I have something that's actually kind of three-dimensional. Of course, I have to rotate it around to really give you that three-dimensional effect, but you can see that as I'm looking at it, I'm looking at now a combination of all the slices at the same time. And I'm looking at it, and I get this kind of blue cylinder. You can see a little bit of the tooth maybe popping up. Um, that's because I haven't really controlled the fundamental features yet. Um, so in particular, if I um, start to vary those, I can actually now see the data in a variety of different views, again, all in 3D context and so forth. Um, so here, what we're looking at, um, you can see I still have that same color map. Um, this widget on the right is trying to indicate what that color map is. Basically, low values are mapped to blue, high values are mapped to red again. And then this black curve that here is just looks like a linear function. This curve is basically showing you um, the opacity transfer function. And I can edit this and manipulate it in pair view. So in particular, I could, for example, add a point here. And I could say, well, let's make all these values opaque. And now, well, I really just get the cylinder itself. Not super interesting, so maybe I should try the opposite. So let's, in fact, take these and add a few more points in the curve. And pull this down and try to make that cylinder itself as, tra as transparent as possible. And in fact, now I've done that, I get this nice kind of 3D representation of the tooth. And you can see some interesting things in the volume. For example, the cap of the tooth is a much higher density value and ends up actually having a much higher function value in the data as well. The roots of the tooth that you see kind of pointing downward, those are a lower function value. And I can start to manipulate those and kind of see different things within the data. So, and if I wanted, maybe I could kind of bring that cylinder back in, but make it kind of semi-transparent so I can see through it, that sort of thing. So you have a lot of interesting controls here, um, and there's a lot of m manipulation here. I'm kind of showing you this at rapid speed, so I'm kind of making it look easy. Um, I don't want to uh, overplay that, though. I actually think like manipulating these things, um, it's something that's a learnable skill, but I wouldn't say it's natural for the first person you look at this. And if this is the first time seeing your volume render, a seeing, or rather seeing a volume render, um, maybe that, that point is resonating with you. Oh, in fact, wow, how did Josh know how to edit all these things and manipulate them all around? Um, I'm maybe making it look a little easier than it is. Um, and that's actually kind of what, one of the points I want to make with respect to this project, which is that setting all these parameters for a volume render takes time, takes effort, takes learning, takes skill, and so forth. Um, maybe there's an opportunity here for a neural network to help along the way, and that's kind of the big takeaway. Um, and let's go back to slides. So in particular, um, I want to point out a few challenges. The first maybe being, how do we let the user know what controls to manipulate along the way? Um, and how do we present those in an interface that's meaningful for a user to work with? Um, there's been a lot of research on this in, in terms of what are the right controls for a user to have. But in particular, that research kind of focuses in the direction of maybe what the best, most efficient way to kind of present the interface, rather than asking questions about, well, what does the user understand about the space of views? Or in general, how does the user maybe enumerate? What are all the possible things I could see within a volume rendering uh, setting working with a particular data set? Um, is it possible to give them an overview of the features rather than showing them just a specific um, view and a specific kind of, um, I guess, kind of forward direction sort of widget where you kind of manipulate one thing, it changes the view. You could ask the reverse question of, well, what are the possible views and what might be the right way to set the um, options to get those views? Um, this is not necessarily a totally new problem, though. I think the new part about this work is employing neural networks for it. Um, and in particular, I want to just show a couple different set, sets of related work out here. So there's been a number of, of related works out there, in particular around, um, you know, 10 years ago. And some of these are actually authors of, uh, of work that has actually been done or, or conducted by people who uh, were at Livermore at some point. Um, and in particular, some of these are focusing on, well, how do we tell the user right, the right things to edit along the way? You can see here in this view, there's a notion of a kind of histogram underneath that maybe I would set um, the transfer function based on that histogram or based on some analysis of the data set itself. 
Um, the other family of views is views that are based on trying to show kind of overviews of the volume itself and what are all the possible things you might be able to see. Um, some of those are based on giving a graph based representation or projection based representation. Um, and these are actually works that are still, I think, out there in terms of kind of interesting models. But, well, how do we actually just help the user a little bit in terms of understanding what they could see in a volume render context? I would say the work I'm going to present today actually fits into both of these categories. So as we're kind of making contributions on both the side of the user edits and the size of volume overviews. So in particular, our, our kind of um, model here is based on trying to study the process of volume rendering in a little bit more detail and saying, where can we actually inject some interesting data analysis? Um, so just to understand that process of volume rendering in cartoon again, we basically start out with a volume. We have a viewpoint, which is where I set the camera around. You can saw me, you saw me rotating around the camera basically by clicking and dragging in the previous um, demo. And then we set this opacity transfer function and this color transfer function. All of those are taken as input. And basically what happens is we solve a mathematical equation called the volume rendering integral. What we're doing is we're actually integrating rays of light as they travel through the volume. And when we do that integration, we essentially produce a final image that we have along the way. And you saw those images basically in real time being updated as I updated the volume render. So one of the things I, I wanna point out, which is, is basically an opportunity for where you could do analysis. Um, in particular, a lot of the related work that's out there does analysis by doing it directly on the data itself, either on the space of viewpoints or on the volume data or the space of opacity transfer functions and so on. And if you do this, what ends up happening is your analysis is basically removed in the end from how the image is produced. You're essentially thinking of the volume render integral as a fixed black box, and I can't control that at all, so I'll just do analysis on the data, and hopefully I can give that analysis to the user itself. The take in this work is a little bit different. The take in this work is we're going to say, let's do the analysis at the volume rendering integral step itself. So really try to understand the mapping from these input parameters to the output images. And our technique and our kind of our trick in this work is to take the volume integral and replace it with a deep generative model. This deep generative model is going to learn how to map from input space to output image. And that deep generative model, as a result, it gives us a vehicle for doing analysis. And in particular, the question we ask in this work is, can analysis on the volume rendering process give information to the user about the volume itself? In particular, can it help the user understand the volume? And if so, what are the ways that we, as viz experts, can build new interfaces around this that help um, accelerate the process of volume rendering or just you know, give the user a little bit more assistance along the way? This is not an entirely new idea. It's actually motivated from work in, I would say probably broadly the machine learning community, but really we're, I'm gonna show a couple computer vision examples here too, um, that are basically doing analysis by synthesis. Basically, we're going to learn how to do volume rendering. So we're gonna learn the synthesis of generating these images, doing so with deep learning. And as a result, that'll give us an analysis kind of angle. Um, and in particular, examples of things like this are image inpainting. So you might learn a lot about an image itself by figuring out how to reconstruct an image or things like um, colorizing black and white images. Both of those, again, are learning a process that's basically doing some th synthesis of new information from partial information. And in doing so, you gain a lot of information itself about um, the space of data that you're working with. Same sort of take in what we're doing here today. So I'm gonna spend a few minutes talking now about how we do the network design and architecture. I'm not gonna go into huge amounts of great detail on the neural networks themselves, but hopefully I'll give you at least a high level take. Um, there's a lot more details in the paper itself uh, in terms of how we actually kind of conducted our experiments and how we studied this. Um, but the main takeaway, hopefully you can walk away from, well, here's a little bit about how the neural networks we use work. So in particular, as I mentioned earlier, we're gonna use a generative model. And in particular, our generative model is going to take as input a data set, which is a collection of volume rendered images and the parameters that were used to generate that image. So basically we're building a big table of inputs and outputs, inputs being the parameters and outputs being the image themselves. And we use a generative network to do this. This generative network is going to be based on generative adversarial networks, popularized by Goodfellow et al. in 2014. They've been used many, many settings since then. Um, they kind of exploded on the market, um, in or exploded in the research setting in, in the mid 2010s and have been used ton for, for tons of different applications since. Um, these networks are actually kind of intriguing in the way that they, they're designed because they're designed to do the optimization a little bit differently than your standard neural network. In particular, it works by actually using a pair of networks that are optimized in concert. The first network is a so-called generator. In our setting, the generator is going to take its input, the parameters themselves, and it's going to produce a volume rendered image. So that generator is basically going to map from input space to output space for us. The second neural network that's optimized in concert is a so-called discriminator. Discriminators here, are, and in our case, our discriminator is basically going to tell us how good of an image have we been able to generate with our generator? So what we do with a discriminator is we actually pass in input parameters and a sample image. And the discriminator just tells us in a binary way, 
is this a real image? Was it from the ground truth data set? Or is it a fake image? Have you basically not generated an image that looks good enough? Um, so what we do when we optimize this is kind of interesting. We basically optimize it in a kind of pass-based way. And the, the first pass is basically an optimization where we update the discriminator. What we do is we basically train the discriminator to know what the space of real images looks like. And we do that by giving it the data set itself. So we give it those input um, uh, parameters and those input images. We train the discriminator and we say, these are all the images that you know are in the class of real images. We then go from there and we train the discriminator to determine what is fake. And we do that by actually now coupling it with the generator itself. So our initial generator, when we pass in Im images, or sorry, when we pass in volume rendering parameters, it's going to produce images, but those images are going to be corrupted with noise. They're not gonna look quite so perfect along the way. So we pass those into the discriminator and we basically say, hey, by the way, these are images that you should think of as fake along the way. At this stage though, is where we use the coupling of the two networks. So now we basically feed back from the discriminator information into the generator that basically says, you need to get better at generating images so that you can start to fool the discriminator itself. So we continue to pump up the generator's ability to generate high quality images, pass those into the discriminator, and we try to train it in such a way that the discriminator eventually sees that these images themselves are actually supposedly real images. So we're basically now starting to fool the discriminator along the way. And this becomes a kind of interesting optimization. We basically are optimizing to the point where the discriminator can't actually tell the difference between the so-called real images from the original data set and so-called fake images from our generator itself. Um, this is not the easiest thing to optimize in, in general. It kind of is like optimizing on kind of a ridge where you're kind of walking up and down on both sides and you, you want to kind of end up on the ridge itself. If you fall too far to one side, you've made the generator too good and this, and maybe the discriminator too poor. Or on the other end, you've made the discriminator too good and it, the generator just doesn't get any better at generating images. There's lots and lots of details about how this training works in the paper. We did a bunch of studies along the way. This was in 2018, so we were really just stepping into, well, how do we do neural networks in the first place? And we we really did a lot of um, we did a lot of extra legwork here, both to convince ourselves it was good, but also actually it turns out to convince the reviewers that this was a good way to go th about this. Um, the first draft of the paper uh, was not necessarily well received by the reviewers um, because they questioned, you know, what are you doing with these neural networks uh, along the way? Um, to our surprise, because we had put a lot of effort into making that kind of clear. So at this point, um, I'm going to switch and just tell you a little bit about the results. Um, I, I want to emphasize something before we look at any of the, these images. Um, back in when we were conducting this work in 2018 and, and the year before in 2017, um, I was extremely skeptical that we'd be able to do this at all. Um, I recall Matt uh, walking into my office at the time. Matt was a postdoc working at Arizona um, before he took his faculty position. And Matt said, we should try this out. And, and I said, there's, there's absolutely no way this is going to work. And it took actually a lot of convincing on Matt's part to, to agree and I have to admit, the surprise of myself was, was extremely unexpected. Um, and and I'm, I'm very pleased as a result because it became a really interesting paper. Um, so here's just some comparisons from the image level. Um, what we're looking at here are basically two different volumes. And you can see there's ground truth, which is the volume rendering for the original volume. Uh, and then the synthesized, I said two, sorry, there's four different volumes in this image. Um, but you can see kind of left and right, the ground truth and synth synthesized pairs. And the synthesized images are actually pretty good. So again, this is a generator that basically just passes in a transfer function, a viewpoint, um, and spits out an image from very limited information along the way. Um, they're not perfect. If you start to stare at these a little bit closer, and I'm not quite sure how well WebEx is transmitting the video along the way, but I'll try to highlight some places where there are pretty significant differences. So for example, on the images on the right, you can see, yeah, there's a few different patterns that came out on kind of this transparent piece of this uh, volume that we're looking at. Um, and they also have things that are color shifts. This might be a little bit subtle to notice, but you can hopefully see kind of right where my mouse is. There's some differences in color. This volume should be kind of totally gray. And here there's some shades of green and maybe some shades of red in the volume as you're looking at. Um, still though, it's pretty good. Um, and I have to admit for the amount of effort we put into training it along the way, um, we were very, very pleased with its ability to kind of produce these so-called images. Um, as a comparison directly to the volume rendering process itself, um, what we did was we actually built a side-by-side -side renderer here. So what you're looking at here on the left image is a render with VTK, the visualization toolkit. So this is in some sense the ground truth renderer that we use. And then the tool that you see on the right, this generative model, is basically our volume renderer um, basically spitting out the images given the parameters that are set on the far right side. Um, and this is totally interactive, so you can run this. This is a little video clip that I'm running along the way showing basically changing the parameters and jointly updating the VTK renderer as well as the generative renderer at the same time. And again, you'll see some differences in between. There's some places where the generator kind of smooths out the image and maybe hallucinates some things that are a little bit different in the space of colors. But by and large, it's actually capturing a pretty good job in terms of um, looking at the figures themselves. Um, and so if, from the point of view of does it actually reproduce the volume render, the answer is, well, if I'm being totally honest, no, it doesn't exactly produce the volume render. 
But the next part of the talk, what I'm really going to emphasize is maybe that's okay. Um, and in particular, the fact that the generative model does a pretty good job is maybe a sufficient job for what we need. And I would point out at this point that our goal was not to completely throw away volume rendering. In fact, there's been 20 or 30 years or even longer than that of optimizing volume rendering. Volume rendering itself is a totally real time um, tool at this point. What we're really trying to do is can we extract information from this process that's useful for trying to build better tools for understanding volume rendering? And that's where the, the neural network really helps us along the way. So in particular, if we kind of focus on the generator network itself, again, that generator takes as input viewpoint, takes as input transfer function, produces the final image for us with whatever nuances the generator gets. The cool thing is though, we can look at this generator process and we can actually do interesting things like say, for a given pixel that's producing the output image, how much was that related to what we set on the input um, generator itself? So in particular, what I can do is I can take the equivalent of a derivative on this network. I can say, if I change the um, input parameters in some way, how much does that resulting change impact the pixel itself? So here you see I'm going to change, and that's the wiggling that I'm doing with that little arrow that you just saw. And I can basically essentially me uh, measure how much does this pixel, how much is it impacted by the original input parameters itself? So this pixel measure basically gives us sensitivity of input to changes in things. And we do this at the pixel level, but we can also do it to the norm of an individual region. So I can tell you information about if I change a region of an image, how much does it, um, or rather if I change an input uh, parameter, how much does it change the region of some image? This is useful because it how, now tells you a little bit about how much the final image I'm looking at is sensitive to the input parameters that I set along the way. That sensitivity basically helps the user understand, well, if I make changes to my input parameters, how much is that going to impact the final image that I'm looking at? And we can build an interface around that. That's what this video is showing you here. Um, so in particular here, we have the color transfer function, opacity transfer function, same sort of thing that you've seen before, but I've added two different um, visualization features to it. And I'm going to advance through a couple little video clips to kind of show you what they mean. The first is this notion of what uh, we're calling global sensitivity. So essentially this red curve that you see kind of behind the opacity transfer function, this is measuring our sensitivity parameter that you see over here. And higher values in the sensitivity parameter means that if I change the opacity transfer function at this point, it should cause a large change in the final image that you're looking at. This is helpful for feature finding. Oh, well, there's features that I'm not seeing in this current view here, but if I change the transfer function in this place, it will tell me a new feature that I haven't seen along the way. So in particular, as you watch this clip, you can see kind of how we're doing that and actually how it's co-located with respect to individual positions as well. The co-location to individual positions is actually being measured by this um, sensitivity kind of color map that we have along the way. Purple means low sensitivity, yellow means higher, and then the regions that have any sensitivity at all are kind of highlighted with these squares. That helps us basically localize not only how much the image will change, but where in particular the volume rendered image will change. And that's what we're calling local sensitivity in this curve. And as you see, I move around, I can now kind of interact with this. If I add notions into the, um, or add uh, bumps into the opacity transfer function, it starts to impact changes in terms of what you see in the volume itself. Um, we claim that this helps you guide user edits. Um, in particular, that guidance helps you see kind of not only um, how much will change, but where those changes happen along the way which is pretty cool. It helps the user see a little bit of information about this. And it's entirely um, view independent. So these curves were competing on the fly by just pulling back through our network. As the camera rotated around, it completely updated the sensitivity curve along the way. In terms of trying to give you a space of all possible images you can look at, we can actually do some analysis on the network design itself. Um, so here I'm going to unpack the neural network a little bit more, um, but not, not in too great of a detail. Um, so in particular, the way our neural network works is we take as inputs, those opacity and color transfer functions, the viewpoint as well, and through a collection of convolutions and fully connected layers, we essentially produce um, the inputs that all get fed into our generator, which finally, through a collection of 2D convolutions, spits out the output image. The interesting thing about the first half of this, the stuff that you see on the left, is those um, networks are basically giving you an encoding of the input space. And in particular, you can think about that encoding as an input space as doing a process of something like dimensionality reduction. For example, the opacity transfer function we treat as a sampled curve. It has 256 points, so basically we're kind of sampling the resolution of 256 values from the minimum to the maximum of the data set. Um, and then we run it through these convolutions, which do some notion of dimensionality reduction. In particular, we actually run them all the way down to an eight-dimensional latent space, and then that gets fed into the 2D convolutions. What's neat about that eight-dimensional latent space is we can decode it. We can basically now take that eight-dimensional space, take any eight-dimensional feature, any eight-dimensional point, and we can pull it back, and it should give us some notion of a transfer function. 
This allows us actually to sample the space of transfer functions relative to the sets of images that they produce. So these two things are now coupled in the sense of this eight-dimensional latent space is actually defined by what happened when we trained for the generator itself. That allows us to actually look at the full space of opacity transfer functions. And we do so by basically taking those eight-dimensional vectors, sampling them, and then projecting them using, in this case, we use TSNE um, to do the projection, although you could argue that different projections might make more sense. I don't want to make too strong a statement about exactly what this latent space is giving us, but it does give us at least a handle on the set of all possible transfer functions we can work with. And for any point in this latent space, I can always decode it and get a transfer function, and I can simultaneously decode it and get the generated image associated with it. This allows us to do all sorts of exploration on the latent space itself. So in particular, I can think about that latent space and navigate through it. And what you'll see on this set of slides is basically I'm going to show you four different points in the space, and I'm going to kind of walk through and show you as I walk along from one point to the next what happened with the transfer function changing and what happened with the, um, the image changing along the way. And again, these clustering patterns that you're seeing in here, I wouldn't, again, make too strong statements. It's not that necessarily super similar transfer functions are all in exactly the same place. Um, we didn't necessarily train our network to give us like clustering on transfer functions or things like that. We're just producing things that are basically giving you some structural information about the space of images as you change along the way. So that exploration is great, but actually you can now use it to build a total overview of all the different transfer functions, at least all the different opacity transfer functions that can be produced. Um, and in particular, the way we do this is we use this sort of widget to basically look at the kind of average um, image that's produced by the set of transfer functions that are nearby to each other. And we're using this four by four grid. So basically what we're going to do is build you an image that's basically something like the average image that you can produce from the transfer functions within that grid cell. Um, here's one example of how that looks. Here, what you see here is we're doing this um, jet data set. We're taking a look at it, and each of these four by four cells are giving us kind of a different set of views along the way. This gives us something like an overview. Here's um, basically 16 different images that you can produce that are kind of sampling the space of possible images that could be produced here with a fixed color transfer function, but varying the opacity transfer function. And we actually build that into an interface, one that's interactive. So I'll talk over this video while it's playing here. It'll take maybe a minute to play. But here you see the user basically setting the camera viewpoint and then adjusting basically the set of images that you see along the way. So this opacity latent space that you're looking at here is decoupled from the, the camera perspective and decoupled from the color map. And we can navigate in it both individually, which is what you're seeing as the mouse moves around, um, but also by playing around with this four by four widget. Um, and slightly later in the video, you'll see what will happen is the user will actually start to edit the mapping of that widget. If they want to focus on essentially only looking at a region of the volume itself, they can redraw the widget, resample, and get four by four images. And all this stuff is just pushed directly through the network and it's pushed through in real time. So essentially what you're seeing here is a renderer that kind of gives you this enabling kind of information just by um, playing around with the, the GAN itself. And here you see now the last part is um, showing that this is actually independent of color. So again, it's only mapping on the opacity transfer function itself. As I vary the color transfer function around, um, I still get the same sort of tools, but it's not like the scattering or the, the scatter plot changes along the way. You could conceivably build a, a feature like this for the, the color transfer functions as well if you wanted to kind of group images that produce similar color images. I suspect what would happen there is you'd produce, though, um, color transfer functions that are just similar sets of colors. So we, we had tried a couple experiments with that, but the opacity one was what we ended up seeing as the most useful at this time. So that's the end of the first part of my talk. Uh, I think I'm about half hour in, which maybe is a good spot here too. Um, I'm happy to take questions if you want at this point, but maybe it makes sense for me to just continue into the second part of the talk and we could hold all questions to the end. Um, Sarah, does that sound okay with you? Uh, yeah, that works. Okay, great. So I'll move on to the next part of the talk. And, and if you have questions, you can type them now. I'll, I'll return to them along the way just so that you don't forget them. Um, but either way, um, I'm comfortable with, with, with one or the other. Um, so part two of this talk is, um, again, building on neural models, but actually what we're going to do is we're going to focus on the volumetric data itself rather than volumetric visualization. And in particular, I'm going to present to you a way to do compression with a neural network model. Um, again, this code is hosted on MapBurger's uh, GitHub repo. You can see the link here along the way. Um, but this is kind of related to the volume viz part in the sense of trying to think about, well, what's our ways that we can think about representing the volume directly? Uh, and the challenge here is maybe a little bit easier to, to say because it's not directly coupled to the volume visualization pipeline. It's just coupled to the fact that volume data gets really large really quick. Um, the idea here is simulations that you're running, complex phenomena that can generate huge outputs in data that are both densely sampled and they're volumetric. So, and sometimes in addition to that, they can be both well, uh, densely sampled in space and time. We have tons of tools these days to generate such data, such data. 
obviously at Livermore, there's lots of simulations being run that generate volume data like this. Although I wouldn't even say that Livermore is the only place of doing it. There's tons of people out there who are generating huge data sets out there. Our downstream analysis tasks, though, don't really keep up. So tools like visualization and volume visualization in particular aren't yet scaling to match the size of the data that we have. So just to kind of point this out in this picture, we're looking at this cool complex phenomenon. The original data set here, um, the terminology I'll use in the slide is basically it has 512 samples in the X direction, 336 samples in the Y direction, 766 samples, 768 samples rather in the Z direction. So you can imagine that, and each of those is a float 32. So if we wanted to measure the number of bytes on this data set, I'd take 512 times 336 times 768 times four, and that would give me the number of bytes in this data set. Um, it turns out, by the way, that sounds like a large number. You'll get to you know uh, billions or whatever. Um, but this is actually not a huge data set. This is still a data set that I can work with on commodity devices like the laptop I'm giving this presentation on. The real data sets that are being out there and simulated right now basically increase each of these numbers by an order of magnitude, which increases the total amount of data by a thousand. So if you think about that, we're now working with data that might be intractable to work with on a commodity machine. And this creates two challenges from the viz side. So the first challenge is, is memory bound. If I want to do any kind of analysis, um, I can't actually fit the entire data in memory to begin with. So I can't actually do that analysis on my commodity desktop. As a result, now I have to do the analysis directly on the, the machine that generated the data, which may be some HPC machine. And honestly, it might be focusing more on doing the simulation itself than the time for doing the analysis. Second problem is a, a more generic one, which is it creates an IO bound. Even if I did have the ability to move this data to my machine, I have to move it <laughs> and generating it on that HPC resource and moving it onto my machine might take a long time if the data set is really big. It'd be great if I could actually make a data set that's smaller, more nimble, and more easy to move around. Um, as a result, if you look at these two problems, it turns out that the notion of data compression ends up being a super appealing solution. Um, and it's used commonplace all sorts of ways for volumetry data, not just for volumetric data, but all sorts of simulation data out there, um, where basically we say, well, it's too big to look at, it's too big to move around, let's compress the data in some way. Um, in the fields that I work with, velocity compression is kind of the de facto way to do this, predominantly because doing any kind of compression that is lossless usually only reduces um, the size of the data by maybe a factor of three, whereas velocity compression, you'll see, I can start to reduce the size of the data by factors of 100. Um, and there's two different flavors of the ways that this is done. Um, the first way is using some kinds of things that I'll call broadly transforms. These are things like sampling the data or subsampling the data in some way, compressing it by blocks or quantizing the, the floating point range, et cetera, et cetera. These transforms are kind of local. They kind of work on chunks of data at the same time. The other approach to doing compression is to do data fitting, which is more of a global approach. It's basically saying, can I fit a curve or fit a function to the entire data set itself and use that fit as basically an approximation of the original data set. In either way, you lose some information because you're either throwing information away directly with the transforms or you're throwing information away because you fit it to a lower order model. Um, but both cases do solve the I.O. bound at the expense of some amount of data fidelity, though. So the lossiness means that, uh, that you lose some information along the way. And the game that we'll play here is basically, well, how do I make the data as small as possible by preserving as much of the data itself? And where do I fit in that space of kind of preserving the data along the way? To date, when this work was presented, most of the techniques out there, I would say, really actually fell into the transform space because data fitting ends up being kind of expensive to do. Um, but I'm going to present today is actually something that I would say really fits more into the data fitting category. Uh, and the technique is actually based on a pretty modern um, neural architecture that's called implicit neural representations. Uh, this is in the last, let's say, 18 months, really become an exciting alternative. You see, you've seen lots of papers out um, that have come out since maybe the early 2020s. Um, on papers that use these implicit neural representations uh, for techniques in visualization, for techniques in computer vision, for techniques in computer graphics along the way. Um, what we do in this work is we show that these uh, implicit neural representations are amenable to doing data compression. So that's kind of our new contribution along the way. Um, predominantly, though, we're basing these on the type of network that's called a siren style network. And the trick in a siren style network is really actually kind of, it's subtle. It basically takes the same sorts of neural architectures that you have. But what it does is it switches the activation functions that you have at each layer of the neural network from what is typically used in the computer vision communities. These are things like relus, um, and to something that is seemingly kind of a simple change. We basically switch them to sinusoidal functions or signs. So this name siren kind of refers to the fact that you have sinusoidal activations. The trick here is that this keeps the ability to maintain so-called robust derivatives. So what I'm going to show you is an animation from Sitzman et al.'s paper um, on implicit neural representations, their siren paper. And what you'll see in this animation is there's 
five different columns where they're comparing basically reconstructing images um, using different networks that have different activation functions. The one on the right to pay attention to is the Siren style network for doing so, and the ones on the left are kind of these more traditional ways along the way. Top row is reconstructing the original image. So you can see the Siren network actually captures the image earlier in time. What's happening is this animation is basically showing you iterations of the network as it trains. Second row is actually showing you the reconstruction of the gradients for the first derivatives. Third row is showing you the reconstruction of the Lawson, the second derivatives of the, the image itself. And in all three instances, the Siren style network captures the image better, captures the gradient better, and it captures the Lawson better. Each time along the way, it captures it better and it captures it faster. So it takes fewer iterations in the network and it produces higher quality. And in some cases, some of the other networks, if you look at their second derivative, they do an extremely poor job of ever capturing the second derivative. In the end, so if you look at like the ReLU or the TanH, they're actually only slowly approximating and never really fully getting to kind of a full reconstruction of the Lawson. And this is kind of surprising actually, because we use these sorts of ReLU style networks in all sorts of tasks along the way. But the key data for us, or the key insight for us is based on the following observation. We're working with scalar field data, and the assumption is actually this sort of data is, in fact, a scalar function. Um, this is, so as a result, it's modeled well by an implicit function. It's modeled well by a function that we assume has some kind of um, derivatives associated with it. Scientific simulations tend to do this. In fact, the Siren style networks, what they showed is a lot of data actually also tends to do this. The Siren style network paper focused on data that was coming out of um, computer vision, but also data that was coming out of sound, data that was coming out of um, solving Poisson's equations and so forth. Um, and the neat part here is that the Siren style networks basically allow you to capture it in a much more robust way. The reason why is these activation functions, because they're sinusoids, are differentiable. So at a high level, what that means is I can continue to take derivatives. You may remember from calculus class, if I take derivative of a sine, I get a cosine. If I take the derivative of cosine, I get a sine and so forth. And I can go back and forth up to infinity. And in particular, I have as many derivatives I want to take. So I have a C infinity continuity sort of system that I'm working with. Very, very different than the sorts of ReLU type functions, which actually don't have continuous derivatives because they're nonlinear. Uh, and the way that they work actually, they're actually trying to truncate information along the way. That makes sense in a computer vision context because most photographs are not continuous functions. They have foregrounds and backgrounds and various objects in them along the way. Scalar fields don't though. Scalar fields are continuous functions and need to have be modeled with continuous derivatives. I don't want to though make it seem like it's just so easy as this. There are some tricks that have to be involved in particular with the way in which you um, initialize the network before you optimize. We do some simple tricks with how we produce residual connections. But other than that, the, the IRS themselves are actually pretty straightforward to work with. In particular, I can describe our compression technique in essentially two slides. First slide is here's um, how we build our neural network. It's a coordinate based neural network. So essentially what it does is it takes as input in X, Y, and Z, and it produces a scalar value f of x, y, z. So it takes three numbers on one side, produces a single number on the end. In the middle is a connection of layers that are basically all activated by sinusoidal activations. And we simply minimize it to um, optimize for minimizing a sum of squared difference between basically what our neural model produces, that's what this f sub theta is, and what our input sampling is. These x uh, are giving us our kind of grid-based sampling of all the different sample positions we look at. We train the network to do that and minimize specifically on that function. Our network as a result now suddenly acts as an oracle. I can give it any x, y position and it will spit out what it believes is an estimation for the scalar value. The cool part is I don't have to sample just on the grid sample points I have. So that, you know, 512 by 336 by 768. In fact, I can now sample at any position I want along the way, regardless of the samples that I had. Um, this is basically a direct representation of the scalar function rather than just a representation of the grid samples. The neat part about this is it actually does a really good job of interpolating the data. So it can tell me the data at any position I want, and it acts now kind of like a random access oracle. I can evaluate the function anywhere I want, and it turns out I can also evaluate the gradient anywhere I want by simply differentiating the network along the way. Um, as a result, I get basically a nice kind of representation of the data itself um, that allows this nice access evaluation any way I want, and I can now just ship around the neural network rather than shipping around the input volume along the way. That's how our neural representations work here. That doesn't necessarily tell you how compression happens though, um, but you know, hopefully at this point you might be able to predict, okay, well, where can compression happen? If the neural network I train is stored in less space than the input data that I started with, I've now just created compression. 
Uh, the cool part is I can actually create a lot of compression this way. Um, and there's some other tricks that can evolve along the way. Essentially, I'm looking at the network is now representing the volume by its set of weights. Um, this corresponds to somehow my representation size. We call this theta in our paper um, if you want to take a look at it. We can also do extra quantization on it. For example, we can try to make the network have sparser activations so that we can actually remove any activations that are very, very close to zero. Those suddenly become places where we can geek out additional extra performance along the way. So at this point, hopefully you're wondering, well, okay, is it actually working as well as I, I'm, I'm claiming it is? So I'm going to show some results to kind of highlight that. Um, in particular, here's a collection where we're looking at five different volumes. I've passed them through a volume render so you can get a picture of kind of the, um, the volume itself along the way. Each of these started out and they were somewhere between 100 and 500 megabytes for data along the way. Again, not gigantic data sets, but we showed it on a, a small enough scale so that you can kind of see where you might be able to generalize. Um, what you're seeing in the second and the third row are basically two different levels of compression along the way. The second row, I've compressed them to the tune of 150 up to maybe 400 to 1 um, in terms of their compression ratio. So essentially, I've compressed them now from 100 to 500 megabytes to something like half a megabyte to maybe almost 2 megabytes along the way, which is pretty significant in terms of the compression. In terms of error measures, I can give you a global measure by looking at signal to noise ratio. This is measured in decibels, and higher is better here. And in particular, we're getting somewhere between 54 and 61 um, PSNR, which is extremely good, just, to, just so you understand. It, it, it's I've seen tolerances in papers where they say, eh, 30 decibels might be okay for representing data. But if you truly want the original data, you know, 60 and 50, or 50 to 60 is much better here. Third row is an extreme uh, extreme amount of compression all the way. Generally, I'm showing you results that are at 600 to 1 or above in terms of their compression ratios. It drops the data to be extremely small. These are all data sets that are out less than a megabyte from original, you know, much more than that. And again, you see some compression um, artifacts and the, the PSNR has dropped, um, although not dropped too much. We're still in the high 40s, low 50s along the way. Just to compare them side by side visually, I'm taking now the bottom right picture and the top right picture and comparing them. Our original 512 megabyte here we're looking at, um, we've compressed it now to 656 to 1, so less than a megabyte. Is it perfect? The answer is no. Hopefully you can see with uh, over Zoom at least some possible features. I'll highlight a couple for you along the way. In particular, there's some noise features that you're seeing here on the right-hand side. By and large, though, I would say for a lossy compression technique, this is tremendously good. Um, pictures, though, are only one way to present this. I think it's helpful to look at numbers, too. So in particular, what we did was we compared to a technique called T-Thresh. T-Thresh, by the way, um, I don't know if Peter managed to join the call along the way, but Peter Lindstrom at Livermore is one of the co-authors of this paper. Um, up until this point, I would have called T-Thresh the de facto best way to do compression. And in fact, T-Thresh still has some neat advantages that over our technique as well, too. Um, but if you look at these slides, what we're doing is we're plotting x-axis compression ratio, uh, y-axis PSNR, so basically better compression to the right, um, better preservation, the further up you go. And essentially what you see in these curves is our null comp on these seven different data sets. Um, our technique null comp is for an equivalent amount of compression producing a better PSNR or at, a, at an equivalent PSNR producing a much higher compression ratio. So toe to toe, we're actually beating T-Thresh along the way, which is kind of neat along the way because T-Thresh, their paper basically said T-Thresh is beating all these other existing techniques that had come out last five or, or five or so years. And how does it look visually if you start to compare these two? Um, so here what you're seeing is basically left uh, to right, basically two different images. We're looking at the ground truth uh, on two different volume rendering, and we're kind of comparing toe to toe. So in the, in the middle row here, you see we took neural comp and T-Thresh, uh, or sorry, in the middle row, you see we took neural comp and we compared them basically at two different PSNRs. We then looked at T-Thresh below that, and those have roughly the same PSNR, but somewhat lower compression ratios. And you can see the artifacts are not exactly the same. I think the one that's maybe most easy to see over WebEx is the kind of noise features that you have, have with T-Thresh kind of in terms of the way they manifest. These were pretty moderate compressions. If we looked at a more extreme compression along the way, kind of to understand, well, what happens if we really push the network to its limits? Here's another image where we're comparing neural comp to T-Thresh. Um, and in particular, we're comparing them again at kind of roughly the same PSNR. Our compression ratio is about a factor two higher. Um, and you can see the artifacts now start to manifest kind of in both images. It's hard to look at this stuff over WebEx, though. So if, you, if you're struggling to say, well, what's different about the two images? Um, even I am, too, a little bit looking at them. Um, they both kind of fail in about the same way. I guess one takeaway, though, about this is we get an extra factor to compression. Final thing to compare is uh, gradient preservation. So looking at this slide here, we can actually add an explicit term into our optimization to preserve gradient. This is just adding this kind of um, lambda-weighted term that you see here on the right. We did a pretty small lambda in our experiments. We used about 5% kind of comparison here, but we essentially said preserve the gradients based on the finite differences gradients that you get in the volume itself. You, you could argue if you had the gradients represented in a different way, you could preserve those in a different way too. 
Um, looking at our comparisons here, we're looking at ISO surfaces rather than volume rendering. These help you see the kind of fluctuations in the surface itself um, by kind of the, the grayscale sorts of uh, undulations you see on the surface. Without this gradient regularization, you see kind of bumpiness in the surface. Gradient regularization helps smooth that out quite a bit. Um, and we're still doing this at, again, a pretty extreme compression ratio. Toe-to-toe um, -to -toe comparison, neural comp versus T-thresh in terms of that comparison. Um, here we're compressing it, compressing it roughly the same PSNRs, but you can see even with equal PSNRs, the gradient PSNR has a drop on the T-thresh, and that's where that kind of noise is popping up in that image on the right. Well, this isn't a perfect technique, um, so it's worthwhile to kind of point out, well, where are the places that there's still room for improvement? Um, and there's two I, I, I want to point out. One is this is a neural network, like any other neural network, it takes time to train. But one thing I want to point out is it doesn't take that much time to train. So this slide is actually kind of interesting on the left-hand side. We're looking at basically compression ratios on the x-axis, training time on the y-axis, and we're showing the pattern for three different volumes. First thing to know is training time here is listed in seconds. So I'm talking about something that might take an hour or two in terms of doing the actual compression along the way, which is really not so bad given the size of the data. The next thing that's interesting is if I compress more, well, I'm training a network with basically fewer weights as a result. So it actually trains faster. So if I want an extreme amount of compression, it takes less work to get there because there's fewer things I'm learning. I'm basically fitting a simpler model to the data rather than fitting a more sophisticated one. And that, as a result, happens faster. Second is there's certain types of noise that we think is really difficult to model in our network. In particular, most of the experiments I showed you were scientific simulation. Um, here I'm showing you an example of what happens if we try to compress a volume that is looking at a medical image. Medical images have different kinds of structured noise in them than volume, uh, volume simulations do. And as a result, you know, we're just looking at our compression. We actually don't get quite the same compression rates out of this. This is an example where we actually only got a 25 to 1 compression rate, PSNR of 35. And this is because our network is, is really not doing anything special to model complex noise. And medical images themselves may be more like a photograph than they are um, like a, a scalar field to begin with. So just to wrap up, because I do want to leave some time for questions. Um, quick high-level idea of the research outlook. Uh, a lot of what we're doing here in this work is, is focusing on the idea of generating basically surrogate representations. And I really like that concept here, where you use a neural representation of some kind of volume or of the volume rendering process itself in a way to enable and improve visualization. That's kind of the theme of this work, which is basically, how do I replace the existing things we have that are either too bulky or too expensive to compute with representations that are good and help for analytic processes along the way? There's tons of questions here. I really showed you, I think, kind of two simple examples where we're looking at either kind of smaller size scale, uh, smaller size data sets, um, data sets that are single rather than groups of data sets like ensembles or time varying volumes. And I think that's where the work goes. Basically, if this stuff works well for um, single shot data sets, um, the anticipation is it will work well for much more complicated data too. And that's where the extra research really needs to be done. And then finally, I just want to give some acknowledgments here. Um, in particular, all the co-authors of my work, uh, the students Jishin and Brian Liu and Karo Jang did great, great jobs on this work. And, and Matt and I have a long history of collaboration together. And it, it's always fun to work on projects with Matt because um, he, he's one of the best collaborators I've had. Uh, and he always has really insightful ideas on things. Both these papers you can find online. Uh, they're free to read. They're, they're published, obviously, in, in the TVCG journal and the Eurowiz conference. But if you want the archive links, I put them up on the web page as well to do. Uh, for you to take a look at. And then this slide also has links to the source code if you want to take a look at it as well. Uh, and then finally, um, this research was supported both from National Science Foundation and the Department of Energy. Um, in particular, my early career award funded a good chunk of this research along the way. Uh, and I want to thank both of those sponsors as well. So I'll stop here, wrap up my talk. Um, I'll leave this title slide up or I can stop sharing screens so it makes sense to start to look at faces. But thanks a lot for paying attention. Uh, and I, I hope you enjoyed the talk and um, I hope it inspired you with some interesting ideas for things you can do on volume vids. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Josh. Um, let's see, do we have any questions? You can either unmute and ask directly, or if you prefer, go ahead and uh, shoot something in the chat. I'll ask a question. Um, this is Andrew. How are you doing, Josh? <laughs> Hi, Andrew. Um, so I, I really like to talk really interesting stuff. I, I hadn't heard you talk about this before. I have one question about the first part of the talk um, where you were describing the architecture of the neural network. And part of it was a, a transfer function, which was, a, I think, a 1D transfer function that went from 256 down to eight dimensions. You're probably that... thinking about this slide. Yeah. Yeah. So my, my question is, why not just use splines or something to represent a 1D transfer function? Why, why bother with the neural network? There, there's plenty of answers to the question, but I'm curious what your, your answer is. Uh, 
we, we spent a lot of time having and hawing about this, to, to believe it or not. So it's an interesting question to ask of like, what exactly is an opacity transfer function? Is it a, a, a sampled 1D curve with 256 points or is it some spline? Um, it, it turns out we, we ended up taking a route that's kind of dependent on the system we were using. So VTK's version of this is you actually model it as a piecewise linear curve where you give it a collection of points and you can set the number of points that you have along the way. Um, but 256 to us felt like a good compromise between okay, fine, we're stuck with piecewise linear transfer functions, and at least we have a high enough sample along the way. I would argue we oversampled it. We probably could have done less than that um, uh, along the way. Um, if you saw when I interacted with Pairview, again, it was piecewise linear. Every point I put in can do that, although I'm, I'm hiding features from you because Pairview, you can actually take those points and you can turn them into a spline. You can basically add a derivative. It's not a like perfect baseline, but close enough for, for things along the way. Um, I don't know if you'd really change the output of the, the work that much, though. So I, I think we spent a lot of time thinking about it, but in the end, it, um, it just boils down to representing kind of the input space all, along the way. Um, the better you represent it, you might be able to build a better mapping directly between it. Um, but I would argue with enough resolution, maybe the linear piecewise way is good enough. Um, it'd be interesting to study um, along the way too. It might also depend on how you want to kind of finally show it to the user in terms of what you want to draw for them along the way. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. Other questions for Josh? So I see a question in chat from Jeremy. Um, he's asking, uh, do you have a sense of cost time comparison between compression learning and the cost of actually producing the data itself? Uh, turbulent fluid simulations like you showed. Uh, I think it's very dependent on the size and scope of the simulation. Uh, I'm hopeful of the following. So um, the slide I showed essentially implied that we can compress in roughly an hour. Um, most of these simulations don't take an hour to produce. They might take days to produce. Um, it depends though. It, it depends a lot on the simulation system. It depends a lot on the resolution. It depends a lot on even things like disk IO, like how much data is it writing out at every time step? Um, and there's another piece that, that I've kind of hidden here, but I, I was curious if anyone in the, um, in the audience was aware of this, which is some of these simulation techniques now are switching over to using neural models for their simulations themselves. Uh, and I realize this wasn't exactly your question, but I, I'm gonna usurp it a little bit to point out, you know, one of the things we, we thought about carefully with this work was, does a neural compression technique make a lot more sense with a neural network model <laughs> in terms of a neural network model for solving the PDE that you might be solving in these sorts of simulations? And I think the answer is kind of yes. Um, I would actually see it it's totally possible to do this in a way where um, as the simulation is running, there's a separate process that basically once a time step is finished, it could immediately apply the compression to the time step itself. So you can kind of do that um, analysis um, in pipeline in a way with the rest of the techniques that are happening there. Um, so I would say, hopefully the compression is still less than that simulation itself. It might depend, um, it, particularly on, the, uh, on the, the type of PDE you're solving and that sort of thing. But I, I kind of, uh, I'm in the camp of, yeah, this is still cheaper um, than generating the data to begin with. Um, and I would say significantly, although I, I don't have actual numbers to back up. No problem. Thanks, Jeremy. Just on, on that topic, could, have you guys thought about something like uh, this as a solution to like archive problems? Right. Oh, you mean in terms of like archiving and storing data, Timo? Yeah, I mean, if, if my archive becomes too big, right? There's issues about inside grants now limiting the number of disk space that they give you, that kind of stuff. Um, that's interesting. Uh, no, is the answer to your question, unfortunately. I haven't thought directly about that. Um, I, I mean, I, I would start to question then, you know, how, how much fidelity does the archive need? So if it's okay for the archive to be lossy, then I, I actually think this does start to sound interesting. Although the, the other number I didn't compare it against, which is most other of these kind of block-based sort of compression techniques, they're, they're much faster. They take far less than an hour to compress a data set of the size that we're looking at. We're talking about like orders of magnitude different, you know, maybe a couple minutes compared to an hour. Um, so if your goal was to do the compression as quickly as possible, um, then you probably would still use one of those techniques. If your goal is to preserve the fidelity of the data as much as possible, well, now it really depends on kind of tolerance. So if it's an archive, I would almost wonder maybe lossy anything is not good enough. Um, but if they're okay with this, then I, I think you have to use the best tool that you have out there and you're probably okay spending the expense. Um, I, I don't know. I, I feel like that's a wishy-washy answer to your question, Timo. Yeah, I, I could kind of go either way on it. Um, sorry <laughs> if, if I don't have no, much more I, to say. I, 
Yeah. It just occurred to me in your answer to Jeremy. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Josh. It looks like we are out, out of time. Um, I'm sure if you have further questions for Josh, he'd welcome an email from you. And additionally, I wanted to point out that at least last I heard, Josh is going to be coming to LNL for a sabbatical this year. So that will be another great opportunity for us to continue to learn from Josh. We're, we're certainly hopeful that, that that it will come in. I don't know exactly what happened with the, the paperwork yet, but that's the current plan. Um, and, and my email is really easy to remember. It's just josh at email.arizona.edu. So um, hopefully, and I put the slide up just so you have it one more time to take a look. Um, but yeah, feel free to email me if you have other questions. I, I'm always happy to chat about this stuff. Uh, and, and thanks again for everyone for listening. I, I, I enjoyed the seminar. It's always fun to talk about this stuff. And, and, and I hope uh, everyone who attended got something interesting out of it. Yeah, definitely. Thanks again, Josh. Okay. Take care, everyone. Bye.